thank you all for making it here for this uh, panel discussion. And you know, big thanks to the ABA to having us here. The topic uh, for this panel discussion is legal and governance challenges facing financial sponsors during the era of localization. And um, you know, what I like about this topic is that at least governance and legal are being used in the same sentence. But the order is legal and governance, not governance and legal. And I think it begs the question that, look, um, you know, what would you rather have? Would you rather have um, a very sophisticated legal contract, legal treaty, uh, you know, running into hundreds of pages, thinking of all possible you know, combinations and you know, fancy definition of loss and things like that, uh, if, 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 if you're an investor, financial sponsor, or would you rather have a board that is really well represented, that is diverse, that has some credible independent directors who can give some time, who can ask the right questions and hold management's feet to the fire, uh, react if issues arise. And uh, I think that's really the difference between uh, you know, governance and legal. And in some ways, legal is the backstop, right? Governance is uh, the, you know, the process that kind of gets us there. No, uh, no, no better panel to really explore some of these nuances and, um, uh, and, and, and you know, and just in terms of format, what I'd like to do is maybe invite uh, the panelists to sort of share their uh, thoughts on, on the topic. I think the one more point I, I wanted to make uh, is, is in relation to this uh, topic of you know, globalization. And uh, we've all wondered what globalization really means. Um, but to my mind, you know, is it that, look, a McDonald's comes to India, takes five years, and you know, starts to do a paneer burger? Uh, you know, through some market survey, I'm not. I'm not really sure. The you know the, the, the folks that we have on the panel, right? Particularly, uh, you know, have uh, you know uh, uh, you know actually invest in startups, and startups, as we all know, are disruptors, right? So there'll be you know someone uh, investing in a startup like Wow Momos that you know takes that McDonald's or Starbucks or whatever it is, and really you know uh, competes with them in terms of market share and revenue and. Uh, you know, creation, creation of value. So I think, uh, you know, in some ways, these financial sponsors are the vehicles of globalization because they take capital, essentially a lot of the, um, you know, the, the, the limited partners, um, you know, for, for, for go those who are in, in, in uni, these are, these are people from whom managers, fund managers raise money, uh, you know, are all in the West and they deploy it in high growth companies and emerging markets. And that shift is what creates challenges because people are giving money with a certain ethos and understanding, but emerging markets work in a very different way. And so I think no better panel to really explore uh, some of these issues. Can I maybe uh, request, um, um, Mohit, if you want to kick us off, just in terms of your thoughts on the, on the, on the topic and um, uh, issues, please. Thanks, thanks, Bharat. And, uh, Thanks to you and the ABA for organizing this and, and having me here. Um, I think uh, obviously this is a important uh, topic, but before I get into it, I thought it would be a good idea to kind of lay down some context, at least from my perspective. Uh, for the last eight years or so now, I have been working with founders. And for the last five months, I am now uh, with Sequoia Capital, which is a, a VC, which is a VC firm. The one common thread that I see between both founders and the VC and the VC is that they're very optimistic people. They have to start, both sides have to start in many ways as dreamers, thinking of what is possible. So I think that is a very important kind of concept to have. Because then sometimes when we talk about corporate governance, there is also a negative connotation to it, which can which can lead with a line of questioning that can lead to some skepticism that, okay, what is happening? You start from a place of suspicion. But I think that is what, especially when we are talking about in the startup ecosystem, is something which we need to realize, that we start from a place of optimism, what we can build, and what is actually possible. Now, in the course of this entire thing, when I'm looking at it, in the last five years, I was, I was actually working in Silicon Valley. One of the things I was telling uh, Bharat is, India is still very, very early when it comes to building our startup ecosystem. So this is again a very important point that we need to keep in mind as we are talking about a topic like governance, uh, you know, especially in this entire ecosystem. When I was growing up, and I'm sure a lot of you as well, uh, India was very different. 
starting a company, especially for those of us whose parents worked in the government sector, uh, you know, it was, it was not something that was normally spoken about. You saw businessmen and entrepreneurs who have already come from established families or who have a political lineage or a connection. Now, I think it's very important to keep in mind that what the venture capitalist theme and, and, and the private equity sector has brought is a great equalizer and a, in many ways a level playing field. So think about it, uh, an IIT or an IIM graduate, a first time founder who only has an idea but is a really promising founder the VC or the private equity person is actually betting on that founder and giving that founder an opportunity to build an iconic company. And we are seeing that happen. And this is only the beginning. We're going to see a lot more of that. So at least in the VC ecosystem, certainly in Sequoia, there's a lot of optimism about this piece. So now we turn to the issue of governance. And you know, at least we have been facing, unfortunately, some of these issues. But I would like to point out that it is a very small percentage of, let's say, fraud that we have seen in some of the startups. You may have read about a bit about it in the papers, so on and so forth. We have to be careful to not have a knee-jerk reaction to this. So some of the things which I'm hearing is, oh my god, you know, what is the role of a nominee director? Have the, have the investors asked? Uh, appropriate questions. Now, just at Sequoia, there are, there are over 600 companies that are part of our portfolio companies. In like three or four, there may have been some issues. So one has to be really careful when you frame this and start saying that, oh, there should be more liability on a nominated director who has nothing to do in the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, you know, uh, day -day functioning of the company. People will stop taking board positions then. So I think it is very important that when we think of these governance uh, uh, themes, we keep this in mind and we keep this balance in mind. Having said that, when we start seeing this, what should we be doing? And I want to be conscious, conscious of uh, time as well, Bharat, so you know, please keep me in check on that. And one of the things which we have to ask, right? It's not just, it's not just we can say that, oh, these things are happening, it'll be a small percentage and we are not going to do anything about it. First and foremost, when we see fraud or when we see wrongdoings which are happening in companies, as investors, I think we need to act. And we need to act swiftly and we need to act quickly. We'll, I'm sure we'll have some discussions around the enforcement uh, systems in our country around that. But that's one thing we need to do. The second thing we need to think of is what can we do in our SHAs, in our constitutional documents, to really seed a culture of governance in our startups. And I think one way to do it, and it'll be great to get some thoughts of the panelists here as well, is on day one of a startup, if you start saying you have to put all these governance things in place, it's not gonna work. The, the founder is focused on product market fit, they have to launch a company, they have to actually run a company. If you put some hundred reporting obligations on them, this is not possible. So maybe one way to think of it is create a stage of graded governance within these documents at an early investment stage itself. Whatever metric you want, either revenue or capital raised or number of employees, as you reach these different thresholds, more corporate governance obligations kind of kick in. And I think this is an important concept we should think about. And then as a culture of corporate governance, the founder should not feel that this is being imposed on me. Rather, the founder will feel that I am growing and therefore, there are these additional obligations that are coming on me. That's how you look at it as a positive. In a way, you are preparing that company for an IPO. And guess what? As you go towards that, um, uh, Bharat, uh, Bharat is spending a lot of time advising companies on how to get prepared towards IPO readiness. So you're telling them, that this is how we're actually preparing you towards that stage. So I think this graded concept, which is seeded at an early level, is something that is worth considering. And the final point I'll say is that I think it's important that this comes up in the entire VC and PE ecosystem. It can't just be one VC or a private equity firm that starts demanding something and others are not doing it. That will have its own set of problems. So I think these are some of the themes which we'd like to you know, which we should consider as we are talking about this, this particular topic. I'm sorry if I was over time.
Thanks, 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 Mohit. I think I, for me, the biggest takeaway was, look, don't penalize the trusting investor, right? Uh, he's not the guy who's perpetrated the fraud. Uh, Ashley, can I request you for your comments on the topic and the theme generally? Sure. Uh, thank you, Bharat. Thank you, ABA, for organizing this conference and having me here. It's a, it's a real privilege. Uh, so the topic is, is, is very, very interesting. It's, it's close to my heart as well as, you know, Mohit, Mohit uh, is on the same page. You know, being from the private equity industry for the last 23 odd years, this is extremely important, right? And I think India is at the stage, to repeat what Mohit said, you know, India is at a stage where, you know, there are entrepreneurs blooming today, right? And, and we are, it's, it's a wonderful situation to be at where, where you have people willing to go out and, and do things differently, create new ideas, you know, come up with new ideas, you know, create something around that, build a business around it. I think it's, it's wonderful for them and it's wonderful for the, the country, the consumers, everyone benefits from it, right? And, and so I think the ecosystem is, is just, is just uh, lovely. I think when one talks about, you know, this, uh, obviously we've read a few things in the press, but, you know, talks about, you know, what is, how do you define governance or how do you, how do you ensure that there is adequate level of governance in some of these young entrepreneurs and young startups? I think it's a, in my mind, it's, it's, it's a tough decision, right? Because we as investors, we are investing in people to a large extent, right? And you want people, you know, the, the entrepreneur to have the drive, the passion to go out and, you know, you know, break boundaries, right? And, and do things, go think out of the box, push the limits. You want them to do that, right? If they're doing exactly the same thing as everybody else did, then what's the, what's, what are they bringing to the table that's different, right? So you want them to, to be thinking that. And then, you know, if you think about governance in isolation, governance is really boxing people in. So you want, you want people who think, or who work outside the box, but you still, at some level, need to box them in. And that's the point that Mohit was making. I'm, I'm completely in saying, how do, you, how do you have that balance where, you know, you, you allow the entrepreneur the freedom to think, the freedom to make decisions, the freedom to be spontaneous, uh, Bharat used the word disruptive, right? You want, you want them to be able to make decisions on the fly, but at the same time, is there a governance mechanism to, to check those decisions to ensure that the, you know, uh, that there's a, all stakeholders are taken care of? So it is a gradual process, and, and you can't have it day one. You need to have that balance, and as an organization grows, both the investor and the entrepreneur need to realize that you need to put some of those checks and balances in place. I, I don't think you can have an independent board on day one. It's pointless. What, what's the board going to do, right? Uh, do, but you know, pre-IPO, you definitely need it, right? So you need, to, you need to build that over time. What's the right time to get a CFO? You, you can't afford a CFO when, you know, in, in, in day three of, of, of a startup, right? So, but, but you need that at some point in time. Uh, so I think it, it's it's a little bit of of, of a balance that needs to needs to play out, and I think we need to recognize that there you know one has to build that over time. Um, yeah, I think those were my my starting thoughts. I mean, on on um, on the legal aspect, we can chat about it. I, in my mind, you know, we've done I don't know about 100, 150 contracts. I think the best thing about legal, I'm not I'm I'm probably the only non-lawyer on the stage and maybe even in the room, so excuse me for that. But for me, you know, every legal contract that we've signed, we've never had to open it, right? And I think that's the way it should be. So some of these conversations need to be, you can, you can put it down in a legal document, but unless there's a buy-in from the other side, you know, it's not gonna, it's not gonna happen. So, so you, can, you can document things as a check and a balance, but in my mind, the, the execution of the legal document is more to ensure that you have a conversation and there's alignment with the other side in terms of you know what what if x occurs you know what what do you do then so that we we can chat about that i know i know we're going to talk about enforcement uh, in a bit so i'll leave that for for later and, and the reason uh, why ashley doesn't have to open the contracts is because his brain is wired lawyer plus plus <laughs> And I think that's the reason why he's, you know, dodged the topic of glocalization. But Harsh, I'll uh, turn to you for your comments on the theme, please. Uh, th thanks, Bharat, and uh, thanks to the ABA for organizing this, uh, this great event. Uh, I, I think, let me just pick up from a point uh, which, which all of you have made. Uh, but take a step back and see what is the difference between a sponsor-packed company and any other company. Um, and if we were to look at other kinds of companies, they are 
owned or backed by another big business. Uh, it could be an Indian conglomerate uh, of which there is no shortage, who are many of, most of which and almost all of which of the big ones have very strong corporate governance credentials as well. Uh, it could be a multinational uh, who is uh, report who is reporting on on a stock exchange somewhere else in the world so in all of those cases there is a degree of command and control uh, and the business fits into the overall governance culture of that organization uh, the difference in a sponsor backed company is um, it it is actually a standalone business in a sense it may be related to some other companies which the sponsor owns, but it is not the same type of relationship. And therefore, in a sense, you start with a blank sheet uh, for, for uh, when you think about governance. And a lot is derived from the culture of the, the founders, the management, uh, and the sponsor in terms of what the governance, what the governance arrangements of that, that company should be. And it's not necessary that the most onerous uh, obligations produce the best outcomes. Uh, a lot depends on uh, the culture of the investors and the culture of the, of the management. Um, and the key value which uh, sponsors bring uh, is not just their money, but the advice that they give to founders and management about the importance of things like having an independent CFO, uh, having a compliance function. Uh, and sponsors have found that, and uh, with, with the experience uh, which you also see on the panel, uh, that bringing those kinds of cultures into a company actually not just helps the, uh, you know, the governance culture of the company, but it also improves the value of the company. Uh, because companies which have a strong governance culture, on average, they tend to be more, more sought after when it comes to exit, when it comes to IPO, uh, simply because uh, those requirements are already in place. So, I'll stop with that. Uh, thanks. thanks, Harsh. So, you know, just in terms of the cadence that we'll follow for on the panel is that, um, just to break it down for the audience as well, some of the some of the members here who are in uni reading law, um, you know, we'll we'll start our questions with uh, you know, and, and I think Mohit made the point on a graded approach, and then Ashley talked about you know constraints when you've got a graded approach in terms of early stage, growth stage, and late stage companies, and uh, you know, so so we'll take that approach as well. We'll start with uh, with with Mohit, and then uh, we'll move on to questions to Ashley, and then you know, Harsh of course has seen seen you know every stage of the cap table and he'll help us critically evaluate some of the themes that are coming up. So I just wanted to sort of set that context. Uh, so, so, so Mohit, I think my first, my first question to you really is that, um, you know, has, has law really failed the expectation of financial sponsors, exceeded the expectations of financial sponsors, or sporadically disappointed uh, in, you know, resulting in an over-reliance on contract? We spend hours and hours and days and days negotiating private contracts, right? So, so what's your assessment there? And in that context, right, you were mentioning some things in terms of, um, you know, uh, that, that could be done for better governance at, at early stage companies. Uh, Ashley mentioned resource constraints. So, so what can be done? Can we at least have conversations uh, to set expectations? So if you could address both those limbs, please. Yeah, there's a lot there, Bharat. Uh, let me try and, uh, uh, you know, pick it from the top. So just in terms of, I think there are a few parts. One is the law, one is the enforcement of the law, and the second is what can we do, uh, you know, as, as let's say, in-house counsels, or, or just even, even uh, business folks like Ashley. First and foremost, I think Ashley made a good po a great point that he hasn't had to open a contract yet. Those are the best kind of relationships that you want to foster with your founders and with your CEOs. That you're in sync, you know exactly what needs to be done and how you're kind of running it, right? But just for pure, has the law failed us? I don't think so. I mean, just from a uh, perspective of what are the concepts in our companies act, 
what, you know, our entire framework, I think, is strong and robust. I don't see any problem in that. A lot of it is just what we are ultimately going to put in the contract, which, which I'll get to. But I think the one place which has or can be a little challenging, again, we also uh, have not had any situation, knock on wood, where we have had to get into some big litigation or dispute with founders or CEOs. We are, we are, there, there's a lot of being in sync when it comes to what is kind of expected. But if I were to just step aside, I think the only critique one could say is the age-old one, which ever since I have been in practice a long time, we would always say the same thing, is the predictability of our enforcement system, especially when it comes to uh, things like fraud. So when you're seeing fraud, fraud is designed by nature to be evaded. You may have the, the most robust corporate governance practices in place, but if there is a person at the other end who wants to indulge in fraud, they will figure out a way to do it. That is at least my experience. I don't know if others agree or disagree. We can put in a culture of governance which could mitigate that, but if somebody has made up their mind that they want to commit fraud, steal money, siphon off something, do related party transactions, they, they will figure out a way to do it. Now the question arises when that happens, is our enforcement system predictable and quick? Again, I don't want, you know, fraud again happens everywhere. In whatever ecosystem in the US, it, it does happen. And there are multiple instances of that. But are we able to prosecute this in a predictable and time-bound manner? Okay, it takes five years, you know what's going to happen, how it is going to move through our judiciary and enforcement system. I think this has always been a challenge. We all know the reasons, backlog, too much of burden on the system, all of those things. But if I were to say is there an expectation in terms of what we need to improve i just think it's this one age old thing now i think the second part is more kind of in our control what could general counsels do what could investors do at the early stage i think there are again two parts to that one is our early interactions with the founders in terms of expectation setting being a helping you know an advisor to them as they are going on this very very difficult journey of building a great company. The second is what we'll actually put in the contract or the SHA, whatever the constitutional documents may be. So I think the first place, at least what we are now trying to do is how do, we, uh, the question I am asking myself is how do we seed corporate governance at an early stage, but in a positive way, that as you are going down this journey of a founder of building an iconic company, this is actually going to be a competitive advantage for you compared to any of your other competitors or peers. And it's actually an ease of doing business. And we do it in a graded way, as I was talking about, as opposed to putting it right at the beginning. Now, for the founder, they need to understand how we are thinking of it. We cannot come from a position of suspicion that, oh, we think you're going to do these bad things, therefore we are asking for these clauses in the contract. No, it's got to be like, as you are growing, these are important things you need to have. You will need to have a CFO in place. You will need to have an audit committee in place. There is a stage in which you get an independent director on board. We are going to help you get that independent director on board. Maybe there's a stage at which you, you get a GC on board. And the way the founder should perceive this is that if I have actually been asked to do these things, it means I'm doing something right. It means I'm growing. And eventually, if I have to IPO or whatever form of exit, it's actually going to help me. So I think that is one of the things which we could do. The other thing which at least I am now trying to do is we have a lot of founders, many early stages. They don't have GCs. They don't have in-house teams. There's obviously a part when we are doing the investment where it's a bit adversarial, where we are on the other side of the table. But when that part concludes and we are partnering with the founder, just as a lawyer, as a GC in this ecosystem, to let them know that, hey, if you have some problem let us know. We could help you problem solve a particular situation. Maybe you're facing, uh, you know, uh, uh, an unreasonable demand by some uh, police station in some corner of the country. I mean, instead of, if, you, if you're not sure what you need to do over there, reach out to us, we can help you. There may be a tricky regulatory situation. Uh, I can ask, uh, you know, uh, Bharat to help, or I can ask you to help, right? refer them and guide them in the right direction. So just letting them know that we are there for them and just having that conversation. At least as lawyers in 
um, you know, the VC or PE ecosystem, I think, is something that's useful. The second part, and I'll wrap up, is just in terms of uh, contracts. And I know for business people, Ashley's like, you know, it is what it is. I'll go by what my lawyers say. But I think it is useful to have expectation setting in relation to that. So, for example, one doesn't hope it happens, but, you know, there may be a situation where somebody is doing a willful misconduct. Like there's a for cause reason. They've actually done something bad in terms of fraud or a related party transaction. I think the first important thing is to have a conversation that, you know, obviously don't have that. But then there's the thing that if that happens, what can be done? And there's a certainty associated in all your investment documentation in relation to that. There's a mechanism that's provided. Maybe it's a clawback. Maybe it's some other form of um, you know, system that we are putting in. The other piece, I think, is information rights that uh, you know, investors need to ensure are there in these documents. Uh, milestone related, I mean, are there quarterly kind of disclosures? How is the MIS being presented? Uh, you know, material litigation, those kind of check-ins and how that information is flowing is also important. So from a contractual side, I think, Bharat, those are some of the things which one could consider not just putting in, but also socializing that on a periodic basis with the founder, with, with whatever is the management team on the other side. Thank, thanks, Mohit. I think you raised, uh, you know, a number of interesting uh, questions and, 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 and issues and, and points. I think... Um, you know, Ashley, if I could ask you, uh, firstly, you know, we've used this word governance, but, you know, what is governance? Is it really alignment of rights? Mohit's, you know, uh, Harsh uh, clearly mentioned that, look, the role of the VC on the board is to, you know, be that sort of uh, anchor point and, you know, be the guiding light in some ways to a, you know, to a founder. But then Mohit's mentioned issues of mechanisms, you know, legally like clawback. So is it really alignment? Uh, is, is, is it governance about process? And then, you know, what are some of the mechanisms that you like to see, you know, as you invest in more mature companies, late stage companies, what are some of the mechanisms you like to see? No, I was just thinking about exactly that, you know, what is, what is governance, right? And governance has different connotations for, for different folks, right? I mean, um, in, in our parlance, when you say a company, oh, we don't want to invest in a company because it has bad governance, it's, it's sort of, you know, very clear that these are people that you don't want to be in bed with because they, you know, you, you don't trust them, right? And, and, and there have been, may have been instances of, of fraud or, you know, or sort of not repaying debt or whatever, right? But if you really think about it, um, that's, that's the negative connotation of governance to some extent. The positive is how do you build a good governance system which is really helping a business institutionalize, right? Uh, and I don't think both, both are you know, uh, opposites of each other, the both concepts, because it is the same thing, right? You want to build and, you know, you start off as a startup, but how can you become an institution, right? And that's where you, you say there's not one person taking decisions, there's a larger subset with the larger subset, you know, uh, you know, the ethics and the morality of the larger group hopefully will prevail versus the, the greed uh, of, of, you know, a, a single individual. So any, any situation where, decisions are centralized to, you know, or, or sort of uh, owned or very autocratic, there is a high chance that, you know, the governance standards may not be the best because, you know, it depends on that individual alone versus if you put it in a group setting, then, you know, the, the standard automatically rises, right? There'll be somebody who will be able to voice a differing view and question uh, the ethics of, of a decision. And it could be, you know, we're not even getting into fraud, right? It's, it's, you know, how do you deal with, for example, related party transactions? You know, the entrepreneur owns 80% of the company. There's, an, there's a sponsor for 20%. He decides, he or she decides to say, you know, I'm going to take this property on rent, but it's owned by his spouse, right? Is that fair, uh, you know, pricing of rent that happens or not? You know, it's, if, if you're an individual and there's nobody else there, that question wouldn't even arise. You'd say, look, it's the best utilization and, you know, for, for the organization, we're getting it at the cheapest rate. But, you know, when you have other stakeholders involved, which could be investors, could be the government, could be employees, could be creditors, any uh, customers, you need to think about, you know, all, all the stakeholders. And when you have a larger group, that's what 
uh, you know, helps you think through what what is the governance standards that we need. So that that was my thought at least. You know, on you know, governance is is one is a check and a balance on on things like fraud, on ethics. The other is is it institutional building, right? Any, any, anything in particular that you look out for when companies have become sort of, you know, gone from the mom and pop, just an idea in the basement to a company which has, say, raised, I don't know, $100 million of capital, yeah. uh, you know, are there some basic expectations that you would have that, no. that, you know, people here in the room, budding lawyers of tomorrow should keep uh, a lookout for and advise their future clients? No, absolutely. I think, look, uh, so I think the, the benefit we have is unlike you know, Mohit, who comes in on the ground floor, we come in on the second floor, the third floor of the stage of company, right? So, so they, you know, where, where the entrepreneur is probably, you know, raised some seed money or maybe a couple of rounds and then comes to Mohit, right? Um, so there's maybe a couple of years of, of really the person, you know, running the business, whereas we come in four years, five years out. So you get to see behavior in, in a longer period. I think in good times, everybody's your friend. How do people behave when, when bad times occur, right? And that's a longer period of time allows you to do that. So I think we have a little bit of benefit from that perspective. But I think, you know, uh, in my mind, you know, again, repeating what Mohit said, the legal agreement is extremely important to document things, but I think mo you, you need to use it well, right? For us, it's important to use that as a basis of having a conversation, right? One of the, one of the toughest conversations that we end up having with entrepreneurs is, you know, what are the consequences of an event of default, right? And, and people will say, oh, you know, you, this is too strong, and why are you talking about it? And, you know, if, if I'm wrongly accused, uh, you know, an FIR has been filed against me, that's not, that's not an event of default. Because, you know, what is the consequence there? We want, we want penal consequences there so that it is, it is really moral suasion to ensure that the, guy, the person doesn't do that, right? Enforcement is going to take a long time, we know that. But can you, can you put some pressure on the person to say, you know, we don't want you to venture into these gray areas, right? And that is where the conversation really starts. And, and you know, I think that is, you, you can gauge by the conversation with the entrepreneur in terms of how they think. And when you push people, you know, I think that's when, that's when you really realize as to, you know, are they, are they in sync from an, from an ethics perspective, from a, from a conflict perspective. I, again, conversations around related party transactions, right? If it is a long drawn conversation and the entrepreneur is justifying to you why, you know, they should have full discretion in doing related party transactions, that's a huge red flag, right? Because, you know, that, that you, you suddenly wonder about, you know, is, uh, you, uh, on the ethics of the person. And, and you know, this may be a, a relatively smaller area, but, you know, how's it gonna play out in other situations? So those are, those are kind of red flags that, that you know, we try to have in terms of a conversation, but it give, the feedback is extremely important to read. Now, there may be peculiar circumstances, and you've got, to, you've got to distill that out. You've got to realize that there may be certain situations where there's a genuine aspect to it um, versus, versus is, it, is it something uh, that the person um, un unfortunately has certain characteristics which, which are very hard to change. Right. No, thanks, 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 Ashley. Uh, Harsh, you uh, you know um, act uh, across across the globe, right? In in, in emerging market situations all over. You've also uh, do a lot of work in India. Uh, you know, are there are our financial sponsors increasingly concerned about governance generally? Is governance a bigger issue in the Indian context? In that context, you know, does India sort of have a discount, uh, you know, for say bad governance, if you will? And when the uh, negotiation that you know Ashley was really alluding to takes place, and the rights package is being firmed up, hopefully to be filed away in a cabinet somewhere, um, you know, what are some of the sticky points that you've seen in your practice? Uh, please. Uh, thanks, Bharat. And you you would uh, you would have seen this from your practice as well. Uh, firstly, I would say on a comparative basis. India has relatively strong governance uh, credentials. Uh, if you look at, it's obviously not just any emerging market, it is in current environment, especially the emerging market. Uh, but if you were to apply the emerging market standard, although India isn't really in a class of its own in that sense, it's a, there are superior governance, uh, there's easily a superior governance record compared to, uh, 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 you know, other markets. Uh, you, by and large, you can trust financial statements. That's a huge thing. Uh, 
and you may not be able to say the same in, in some other jurisdictions which uh, in a sense are less emerging than, than India. Uh, so I think uh, while sometimes exceptions stick out, on average it's, it's, uh, it's a very pretty strong governance picture. Uh, and a, a relatively robust approach from uh, regulators also, uh, in a sense, has uh, moved the needle because uh, people do take governance more seriously now. On the contract, uh, you know, on the contracts, legal documents, um, I would say there's yeah, the the let let me quote uh, Charlie Munger, the famous investor who said, uh, show me the incentives and I'll show you the outcomes. Uh, and whenever you sit down to draft or, or, or negotiate documents, more than f focusing on what must be done and how to enforce it, it's really about setting up the right set of incentives, uh, whether it's an incentive plan, management incentive plan, uh, which is very common in sponsor-held uh, sponsor companies, uh, you, where you want employees to think about long-term outcomes uh, in terms of the value of the stock, stock that they will hold, or it's in, it's in a contract, uh, the shareholders agreement. What you really want to do is set up incentives, set it up in a way that the incentives of management and the incentives of founders are aligned with the principles of good governance, are aligned with the objectives of the investor. Uh, and that goes a long way. So because no amount of um, so, I mean, enforceable hard obligations are really as good as having the right set of incentives uh, in an arrangement. Yeah, absolutely wise, counsel. Um, so, you know, um, uh, Mohit, if I could again just uh, switch gears and, you know, uh, ask you, um, it's it's a very different environment today. You know, we've come through COVID, but you know, so if you look at pre-COVID or even during COVID, you know, the global environment is very different. You've got inflation, you've got high interest rates, you've got the situation in Ukraine, geopolitics, etc. So, if you're a company, right, raising capital now, uh, essentially you run uh, run out of fuel in your tank. You now need to go and raise capital. What what is the environment like? And what are you seeing companies do at this stage? Are they just doing flat rounds? Are they see, are they doing down rounds? And, and sometimes, you know, when you start talking about, you know, these kind of fancy terminal, deal terminology and for some of the students here, you know, please go look, look some of this stuff up, um, you know, it, it comes with some very interesting terms, right? It comes with options to convert, to address Indian law requirements, you have to do some fancy stuff, um, which I won't get into, you know, is, is all of that advisable or is, you know, are there just enforcement challenges just being ramped up and should we just keep things simple? Um, again, a, a, a lot multi-layered questions, <laughs> so I'll try and address them again. So obviously, the the environment we are in today is is very different for all the reasons you said, Bharat. And it, the the change is also in many ways. Some could say it was expected, but it was kind of sudden. At the peak of 2021, uh, you know, it was the the market was. I'm trying to think of the right <laughs> adjective. I was going to say crazy. I don't want to say that, but it was it was with with the availability of capital being so easy at at low interest rates. I think expectation settings had become very different. So, you know, just asking for increased rights, for example, in relation to governance, information rights, vesting as a concept, uh, because especially at the early stage, not so much for for Ashley, but 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 at, at an early stage in a company, you want to ensure that the founder is not like quitting six months into it and still getting all the equity and moving on. So negotiating those kind of things were becoming challenging at that peak when there's a lot of competition, uh, for want of a better word, in relation to getting a deal. Now I think the market is definitely getting a lot more tempered. And in a way, while of course the overall situation is something that we'll just have to go through. Bear markets, bull markets happen all the time. But I think this tempering is going to give everyone an opportunity to, to help the ecosystem, the startup ecosystem especially, mature a lot more. I think expectations on all sides in terms of valuations have, have become much more reasonable. So it's not unusual now to see uh, flat rounds or down rounds. 
And one way to look at it, I would say, Bharat, is look at how uh, public companies are doing. If the stock prices there are falling, one thing which you know companies and young founders have to realize is that is going to reflect, it's a market reality. It is not something that is ideal, but it is a reality and that should be priced into whatever is the price of your stock or whatever is the price at the last kind of uh, valuation and funding round that you're taking. So I think this realism we are definitely seeing. I think it is a, overall, again, it's, a, it's, a, it's an opportunity for everyone to be like, okay, what, what, can, we, what can we do more in terms of go governance, in terms of information, in terms of transparency? To your last question, Bharat, in relation to should we even have a lot of these clauses? Again, I think every, every negotiation is, is actually different. And I don't know if you find that surprising. I did find that surprising. I thought it's going to be pretty standard. I, we could come in and say these are the terms, take it or leave it, but it's not like that. Every negotiation is different. There are very unique points that are negotiated in each, uh, in each contract or SHA. Uh, having said that, I think we can't think of, is this enforceable at the end of it, or what is the practicality of enforcement, therefore don't include it. I think what that basic constitutional document, if I would put it in that way, is a very important thing for expectation setting. So for example, if there is an or at cause, if, some, if you are indulging in fraud, A, B, C will happen, you would lose... I, and I think that is, uh, to, to your point, if somebody is pushing back on some of those things, that in and of itself is a big red flag. Because keep in mind, unlike Ashley, we are coming in at a very early stage. In many cases, the founders don't even, uh, there's, there's, there's barely a business. It's a bet on the individual and their idea and how they are going to execute. So I think a lot of this is a great opportunity for the entire ecosystem to have a reset in terms of expectation. And we are going to certainly learn from some of uh, the issues that we are seeing, which are cropping up in the entire industry, and try to ensure that uh, you know those things are reflected uh, in documents. But again, I want to underscore this. Founders are doing a really hard job. So it's very important that the entire ecosystem is not dealing with them from a place of suspicion. But this is important for your growth. For uh, Ashley to eventually make his investment, this is important. And from there on, as you go into IPO, this gets even more important. So I think that is what we have to look forward in terms of what are our deal terms and all. We don't want to get into all the technicalities. I don't think that's going to be a, a useful exercise here. But I think conceptually, that's how we should we should be thinking of it. Uh, thanks, Mohit. I mean, I think I think my two cents, and I and I often have this conversation with folks is, look, if you've run out of gas, and you know you've got to bet the company versus you know whatever rights package there is in the document, you know the choice is pretty clear because as as you say, and I think as Ashley said as well, you know it's a bet on the individual, right? Somebody's trusting you with their money and your idea. So, um, uh, but of course, it's a, it's a complex issue, and I don't want to oversimplify it uh, because because of various I items. But I think, um, I think just moving on, right, in terms of what's happening in the ecosystem, there are now so many companies, great ideas, great teams, all backed by financial sponsors. And it, in many occasions, financial sponsors have taken money off the table. Companies have exited, they've IPO'd. And in, in some ways, uh, you know, financial sponsors, VCs have had a huge impact on the ecosystem. So, uh, you know, Ashley, would you, would you just like to maybe talk a little bit about that? I think there have also been some... Uh, challenges that have occurred in the recent past in terms of COVID and Press Note 3, et cetera, but these may be slightly more technical topics. I don't know whether you want to talk about those in particular, but, but you know, could you just maybe talk about the impact of uh, all this money and these exit opportunities? Thanks, Sabarat. Uh, no, so, uh, look, I think um, as investors, um, we wear multiple hats, right? So one is obviously uh, fiduciary responsibility to the people who've given us money, right? And then there's the responsibility of uh, nurturing the companies that we invest in, right? Um, so it, there will be there will be times of turbulence. There will be times like COVID where things get disrupted. I think what what we have learned, and it's our responsibility to some extent as as financial sponsors, and and you know that's part of the reason why entrepreneurs or, or companies bring us on board, right? I mean. 
the value proposition is not necessarily only the money, right? They're not looking at private equity investors or even venture capital investors for, for their money. In fact, probably more at the venture stage than looking at you know, the plus plus, right? Money is important. We've, we've had situations where we've been able to close transactions at you know, a 10% discount to the best possible price out there because the entrepreneur said, I'm looking for a partner. I'm looking for someone who can help me grow my business, think about things, and I'm going to learn from that. And they realized that you know, the, the short-term valuation hit is a small price to pay for the long-term, you know, larger growth story that they may, they may be able to uncover, right? So when they talk to, you know, uh, Sequoia, the idea is, you know, Sequoia has seen this, these, these issues in, I don't know, 200, 300, 400 companies, right? So you have a problem, there is a potential solution out there. That solution may not work, but at least, you know, you don't need to go do all of the groundwork. That's the whole idea. So, so I think as, as investors, that's our responsibility. Um, of course, in situations like COVID, everybody was learning, right? That never ha ever happened. But we were able to use best practices amongst our portfolio companies saying that somebody's got a great idea in terms of how do you, how do you, you know, so we, we work with IT companies, for example, you know, um, how do you provide the security to a US customer that a person working from their own home in a very unsecured sort of, in <laughs> with, with very, very low-fi uh, internet, is able to still able to do that, right? And then we saw solutions. We saw what other people were doing, and and you know you 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 use that. And so I think that's part of our responsibility, you know, to 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 do that. Um, and then the other point which I was making earlier, which is I think the responsibility of towards other stakeholders is also extremely important. And I think as as investors, as financial sponsors, it's important to to do that. Harsh talked about the point that you know all this adds into getting a better. Uh, you know, company being uh, treated as as one having a much higher level of governance, and what that does is it actually drives up valuation. So when we look at exits, you know, a, a better governed company will 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 enjoy a superior multiple, and that is that that's a you know it's a it's a win win for everyone. The person coming in, the investors coming in, know that you know there is some trust, there is some security of their capital. The investors going out have a better exit. The entrepreneur is again has the opportunity to partner with a good partner, right? Employees, stock options are, are better. Customers that are higher levels of services. Vendors, you know, there's a lot more purchasing happening. So everybody benefits in that kind of situation. So I think that is the universe that we need to move towards. And we're actually seeing that change, especially in, in older businesses. You know, we, we've backed some businesses where, you know, the entrepreneur is a, it's a family run business run for many, many years. You're seeing the, the, the second and the third generation saying, you know, we, you know, we were doing things, a lot of things were off the books. Maybe we need to just keep everything on the books. And that is a better idea because then we can get more scale, we can get more, you know, better management to run it. The, the, the pie will be much bigger. Uh, and even though this, our slice of the pie reduces, it will still be a win-win situation. So we're seeing that happen. And I think that's, again, uh, you know, uh, that's what keeps us interested. We've been investing for 23 years. I think we, we only see India as an option uh, for us to invest. And, and, and we love this part of the story. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, Ashley. I think the, you know, the whole idea that you know, governance just avoids boardroom drama you know, and uh, ensures that decisions are taken quickly and fast and smoothly and then gives you better multiples on exit is, is uh, well made. What, I think... Uh, what may be what, sorry to interrupt. What may be interesting to see, uh, and there are so many students here as well, is actually some study which correlates that. How better governed companies are actually able to face, uh, to, uh, get better multiples. I think that's a very important point. No, ab absolutely. And I think, I think it also, you know, I mean, what happens is I think in my experience at least, bad governance is weaponized, right? At some point, someone will say, let me use bad governance and weaponize it and then just, you know, sub subtract value in that sense. Whereas if you have good governance, you're strong, independent or someone, you know, he just makes things, things, things work. But Harsh, I, and, and again, I'm going to maybe ask because it's, it's sort of le key legal and governance challenges. I'm going to ask you a slightly uh, technical question, which I think is really important for everyone who's a, you know, who's, who's a practitioner. Uh, which is, you know, very often we have deals which are subject to regulatory conditions. And if those regulatory conditions, for example, say a competition commission approval, is, does not come by a certain date, the agreement just terminates. 
and that leads to disappointment. But sometimes, you know, people can game the situation because the seller could say, "Look, I may have a better offer in the, you know, you know, on the sidelines. So let me just game it, wait for a better price." So, you know, what, what how, how should deal practitioners be thinking about and dealing with these kind of risks? How can regulators work better uh, and be better governed, you know, so that there's more deal certainty and predictability? Your, your thoughts on this, please. Um, I'll answer this at a, at a more general level. Um, and I, I'm sure you'll have your perspective on this uh, from, uh, you know, from so many different situations. Uh, and we also have the benefit of uh, two sponsors who have a remarkable record of having created value in the long term and partnered up with, uh, you know, with founders of all sorts. Um, what you, we do have, of course, lots of contractual restrictions about non-solicitation of other offers and so on when a deal is signed. Um, in other words, once it's signed, uh, really, the founder or the seller should not be talking to others. But underlying all of that is, is the question of whether the deal is a fair one, uh, whether the founder is happy to be partnering with that investor, and whether strategically there's a fit. Uh, and of course, it's always possible for somebody to run, off, run out the clock on, on, on a deal uh, by delaying uh, approvals or CPs and so on. Uh, but uh, we don't see that happen very often, to be honest, and maybe it's because of the sorts of investors we work with, the sorts of founders uh, we work with, uh, because those kinds of deals tend to happen where there is a strong motivation on both sides and that strategic fit is in place. So there's no real incentive in, in, in that case uh, for someone uh, to do that. Uh, where you do see this sometimes is in, and you, we don't see this very much in India really, is public company auction deals, uh, which uh, especially US style deals, where you do have to focus on, on, on uh, you know, break fees and, and non-solicitations and so on, because there also the directors have a fiduciary duty to maximize shareholder value. Uh, but in, in the, on the private side, I would say experience on this front has been positive. So, um, you know, we've got uh, five minutes left, and I just want to maybe check with the organizers: should we, you know, do a a Q and A, which spills over, or um, or sh five yeah, within 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 these five minutes? Okay. So, um, I just wanted to check if anybody has any burning questions. Okay, there's a hand raised at the back, so maybe if someone could pass a microphone there, that'll be. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So it's one, one of the things I was saying right at the beginning as well, um, and this is just my thought right now. Uh, I'm still relatively new to the VC world. At different stages of the companies, you have to think of governance very differently. At an early stage when it's just an idea, when there are two founders who are trying to find product market fit, if you put in hundreds of conditions around governance, it's not going to work. You want them to build the product and build a successful company. But as it grows, is when you will have to slowly have graded levels of governance. It can, you can link it to revenue, you can link it to uh, capital raised, you can link it to number of employees. And at each stage, it gets more and more, you're, you're gonna ask for more and more of these things. I think it is worth exploring that at the initial stages of investment itself, you seed these ideas in and develop it into your contracts. That look, as you grow, these are the governance standards that we will expect. We'll expect you to appoint a CFO, an audit committee, uh, you know, independent directors. There may be quarterly kind of reviews of 
um, you know, what, what are the material disputes that are rising, so on and so forth. So I think this needs to be built in a graded way. And I think it's very important that the, I mean, VCP again come in at different stages. So let me talk about the VC uh, ecosystem first, that maybe the IVCA thinks of what is, like, this is a standard position that all VCs in the ecosystem now agree to. So then it's not a sell with the founders. And from the founders' perspective, they think of this as, oh, awesome. I'm getting the next stage of governance, but that's because I've hit this next stage of growth. So yeah. they also look at it as a positive. I think that's how I would think of it. Do you want to weigh in? Yeah, I think uh, uh, Mohit's covered uh, most part. I think the one part that you talked about at the start of your question was, you know, um, agreements tend to be focused on on certain aspects, there's a business aspect that's forward looking, right? I think it's important and I think India has evolved and, and to its credit, right? 20 years ago uh, or 25 years ago when we first started doing these things, especially in India, you know, the, the legal agreements were being looked at in isolation, not really from a business perspective. I think, and, and we noticed that, you know, overseas there was a lot more conversations that the lawyers would have with the business folks. Today that is happening, and, and that is very, very important, right? Because you need, to have, you need to have an understanding of what the business aspects are, and the document needs to, to capture that, not the other way. Because you, you can't force fit an, an SHA into a business model, right? It's the other way. So you gotta think about what's, what's the business going to do? You know, are you gonna, are you gonna grow? Right? What, what, what are the stages, and how does that translate into what you need to capture uh, and, and the SHA really, or the, or the documents are really, you know, probabilistic events of what may or may not occur in the future. So if you don't look at the business aspect of it, then the document is really, you know, not, not really very valuable. That's right. So basically my question is more, how can the document be more valuable? Because you already have reserve matters protecting you for negative rights, right? But I don't see in a governance structure that investors are sitting on the same committee. Yes, there is knowledge sharing, but positive is never written in a governance structure in the SHA generally. Is there something you guys are also thinking about that that may actually get you a better value? Maybe because that's something which is good for a PE fund, you may get better value because you're trying to put in governance which nobody else is offering. No, no, absolutely. I think so. Yeah, exactly. The, the point that uh, I think you made as well, right, uh, is incentives, right? How do you get alignment? And, and the key is to get alignment, right? Do you, you need to have those conversations. You need to, you need to understand what, what motivates people and how do you get alignment, right? So there, there, are, there are positive aspects and, and, you know, that's where people can get very, very creative saying that if I exit at above a X value, you will get, you know, your, your incentive goes up significantly or if you are able to achieve it. So that's the, that's the carrot, right, as opposed to just the sticks approach. But even, even on that side, uh, I think it's important to have the conversation, right? So when you are having the conversation on, on reserved matters, the conversation needs to be, you know, you know, these are exceptions. We need you to run this business. This is, we, we are only talking about situations where our investment thesis potentially is in jeopardy, right? So it, it, I think that context needs to be built in and there needs to be a conversation with both the business aspects and the legal aspects. You cannot have any of those in isolation. That's not gonna work. Uh, unfortunately, the legal agreement, see, well, there are infinite possibilities and so the legal agreements are meant to capture the adverse possibilities, right? Uh, there'll be few instances like, like alignment, et cetera, where you're thinking of the future, you're thinking of what, what's going to happen at an exit, you know, who's going to drive the exit, for example. But a lot of those are, are trying to protect uh, the investor and therefore they will be, you know, uh, negative in nature. But the conversation, if you can have with, with uh, you know, uh, think wearing the business hat, I think that's very, very important and that builds a level of rapport and comfort uh, you know, with the entrepreneur, and, and they are able to say, look, that makes sense. We understand where you're coming from. We understand the, the reason for, for a certain clause. Any other burning questions? We'll take one because uh, time is up, but we'll take one if there is a burning question. Yeah, one more hand up. Please go ahead. Yeah. Is there a penalty? What is the size of the penalty? Can I get away if I pay the penalty? And that's okay. I don't know if you think, yeah, you know, how you see this. Is this true? Is this a challenge? 
No, sure. So I, I, I think Mohit is, is well qualified to answer this question, but I can, I can, I can, I can take a stab at that. Um, yes, I see. I think at some level, uh, uh, you know, there are a set of deterrents and a set of incentives in the contract, as, as you know. So, um, at least from what what my experience has been is that founders, by and large, want to see value created over the long term. Uh, along the way, they may have different perspectives about this, the materiality of some some uh, restrictions upon them. Um, and along the journey of that company, there is a back and forth between the between the founder. At least there should be, I think, and maybe that's the real takeaway from your question: uh, that there should be a back and forth and a channel for communication, so that those, if there is a need to revisit those kinds of boundaries. Uh, there can be a conversation about it, uh, and uh, the the arrangement and relationship between the parties should enable that conversation, rather than um, encouraging the founder or enabling the founder to or or, or, or to uh, basically make those decisions unilaterally in the dark, because by because on the whole, in the from a you know high level perspective, there's a commonality of of objective to create value. I don't yeah. know. If I just add maybe quickly that you know I think I think as lawyers it's partly our duty to also support innovation, right? To the extent that there's a penalty, that's actually great because you've got certainty, right? I think we dabble in areas as lawyers at least which are gray, which and it becomes much harder to really predict which line of the site, which which line, which side of the line you're on. But but I think I think that's the that's what a you know fuels our juices in some ways, but also leads to you know innovation, capital formation, and if you look at the history of the Silicon Valley and venture capital. It's all about uh, essentially innovation and, and in, in, in areas which are you know untested and unbound. But I, I mean, it's not for the faint-hearted. I would say for sure. Okay, with that, I think time's uh, up. Uh, unless the panelists have any concluding thoughts, uh, I'd just like to thank the panel very much for their time. Several of them have flown into town for this. Uh, I'd also like to thank the audience for being very patient. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. For